After spreading around the globe for thousands of years, a crop originally cultivated in southern China now feeds more than half the population of the world. That crop is rice. But the competition for survival is every bit as fierce in the world of plants as it is among men. Rice has had to adapt to survive in northern China, from the arid plateau to the freezing northeast. Its characteristics changed in order to reproduce. This in turn has changed the living conditions of the accompanying populations. The story of rice is almost a short history of ancient China. The boundless snow-capped mountains and windswept grasslands make China's western borderlands a forbidding place. This harsh environment has influenced the stability and security in the East Asia continent. Over thousands of years, many travelers who braved the hardships to cross the Asian continent quietly changed the diet of northern China. Remains of millet and glutinous millet have been found in many places in northern China. About 6,000 years ago, they were widely planted in the middle and lower reaches of the Yellow River. In the prehistoric age, rain-fed agriculture was the economic mainstay in the areas of Yangshao culture in northern China. For ancient people, dairy products and meat were the main staples of nomadic life. Over the span of history, rice was mostly an imported food for the people living in Western China. Many people believe that the cold, dry climate of Northern China was ill-suited to rice, which prefers a warm and humid climate but this might be wrong. Northeast China provided high quality rice for the Qing imperial family from the late 17th century. Rice had a growing season from late spring to mid-autumn, when the banks of the Ya Lu and Tu Man rivers were suffused with the fragrance of rice. What the local farmers didn't know is that the fertile black soil beneath their feet is in a golden belt of rice production. So how did rice journey from the warm south to the cold north
。你要从一个地方要扩散到另外一个地方，没有一些特殊的工具，比方说通过鸟，通过什么把种子带到很远的地方，你是很难扩散的很快的。The Guangzhou area of Shaanxi Province is one of the ancient heartlands of Chinese civilization. Numerous treasures and proofs of the secrets of early civilizations are buried in its soil. Twenty kilometers from downtown Xi'an. Archaeologists are excavating a prehistoric site at Yang Guanchai Village. Archaeologists are sure that this large settlement dates from the era of Miao Di Go culture, nearly 6,000 years ago. The place would have been expected to be sparsely populated back then. How could so many people live there? Is it possible that rice was also grown on this land? Although archaeologists haven't found any traces of rice here, some other proofs have been found. Qianhu village is about 100 kilometers away from Yangguanjai village. It's an old local custom to make doe tigers as tribute to the deceased at the Tomb Sweeping Festival. The local children who are waiting to eat their doe tigers have no idea that the area was being cultivated some 6,000 years ago. In 1997, Wang Wei Lin led a third large-scale excavation here and found traces of rice from more than 6,000 years ago. This carbonized object was found in Chenhu village. It has been identified as a grain of rice from 6,000 years ago. In the remote Neolithic age, rice had already taken root in Guangzhou. So 河北南部地区，邯郸、慈县这一带，那呃有很很很丰富的水稻水稻种子。The Book of Songs was compiled three thousand years ago. It contains a phrase that describes a river flowing to the north and irrigating rice fields. This shows that rice cultivation was already using artificial irrigation at that time.
From the Three Kingdoms period, rice was widely grown in today's Beijing, southern Hebei, southern Shanxi, and southern Hunan. Rice fields are commonplace today. But thousands of years ago, the well-arranged, boundless paddy fields looked quite unusual. They were the result of the acclimatization of rice by humans over a long period. It seems that thousands of years ago, the acclimatization of rice from the south made huge progress in the north. But in the Yellow River Basin, more drought-tolerant crops still held the dominant position. In 1989, under this cliff, cut through by a highway, archaeologist Tian Jian Wen excavated two granaries from more than 4,000 years ago. Together, they had a capacity of 65 cubic meters. These carbonized grains were found by Tian Jian Wen at the bottom of the granaries. They were identified as millet. It is estimated that the two granaries could store nearly 40,000 kilograms of millet. Tian Jian Wen also found pieces of pottery in a location dozens of kilometers away from the granaries. They look unimpressive, but they were farming tools used by the local people 6,000 years ago. A lot of well-preserved millet was found lodged in the tools. This shows the local climate had been quite dry. Based on this, Tian Jian Wen speculates that millet was being widely planted in the Yellow River Basin 6,000 years ago. Eight thousand years ago, the temperature in the Yellow River Basin was about 2.3 degrees Celsius higher than today. The area had dense vegetation, ample rainfall, and many lakes. It nurtured the development of agricultural civilization in early China. Of the five cereals, millet was the first to be grown widely in the Yellow River Basin. After it spread from southern China to the middle and lower reaches of the Yellow River, rice sought a place for itself. Rice remains have been found at the Huwa Chai and Chunhu village sites in Shanxi province. These two sites are both from around 6,000 years ago. Rice remains have also been found in over 1,000 archaeological sites, dating back 4,000 years to 4,500 years in the middle and lower reaches of the Yellow River. In Yanshi, Hunan province, a large amount of rice was found at Arli Tou, 
a site which is believed to be around the location of the Xia Dynasty's capital. Fen Chung was named after the Fen Hua River. It is said that the town has a history of nearly 2,000 years. All Shanxi locals love vinegar, including the citizens of Fen Chung. Normally, Shanxi vinegar is made from sorghum, but here in Fen Chung, the vinegar is made from millet. Following the ancient method, Li Anlong, who has 40 years experience of vinegar making, puts the millet into a clay jar. The lid is made from loess and wheat straw. The structure of the lid can't be too dense or too loose. The millet is steamed, and then the fermentation takes at least four months. Li An Long is renowned for his vinegar making skills. No one knows when vinegar making with millet started. The life in Fen Chung is slow paced, like an old man who is always on the brink of a fresh step, regardless of the surroundings. The slow pace means that local ideas and customs are slow to change. Maybe these customs are all outdated, but it at least shows that they've never lost contact with their heritage. The making of vinegar with millet would seem to indicate that the crop was once widely grown. And the use of millet to make liquor and other products indicates that thousands of years ago, Millet was established as a staple crop in the Yellow River Basin. Rice in the north was like a fish out of water. But its situation in the north was changed by people's idea about it. In human society, scarce goods are frequently the most sought after. Confucius once asked, are you comfortable with eating good rice and wearing fine silk? This shows that in northern China, eating rice was considered to be a luxury. It was in short supply, thus much in demand. Eating soft rice becomes a symbol of social status. With human help, rice started to make use of its biological characteristics to secure a place in the order of nature. Zhang Ye 
is in northwest Gansu province. This location on the ancient Silk Road was of great strategic importance in ancient times. The reddish-brown mountains look like flames. Though spectacular, the Danxia landform is barren. Yet 70 kilometers away, the scene is quite different. It's early October. 48-year-old Wang Jianrong and his wife are harvesting rice. They work carefully as if performing a special ritual. Their half-acre paddy is surrounded by cornfields. Most areas in northwestern China are arid, with little in the way of rainfall. Wujiang town is an exception. The melting snow from the Qilian Mountains runs through Jiangye and nurtures oases and wetlands in the desert. Wujiang town is the lowest lying place in Jiangye. With the melting snows and brilliant sunshine, the place is perfect for growing rice. The locals grow rice by lakes and rivers. Rice thrives in this place surrounded by barren land. As Wang Jianrong remembers, rice has never been their staple food, but it is still greatly treasured. Today he grows rice on a small scale to relive his childhood memories. The harvested rice and the paddy field are surrounded by cornfields. This is the situation of rice in northwestern China. Surrounded by upland crops, it still survives. As time goes by, the relationship between rice and humans has become closer. Wild rice has retreated from its human association and returned to the wild. Having been domesticated over thousands of years, cultivated rice now accompanies mankind all around the world. But this history has seen it lose the ability to propagate itself naturally. In the Warring States era, more than 2,000 years ago, the western Zhou state dammed the upper reaches of the Yellow River, so the eastern Zhou state on the lower reaches couldn't plant any rice. The Western Zhou wanted to gain political power, and controlling the growth of rice gave them that power. This was not just an agricultural issue, but the epitome of competition in human society.
Rice thrives in the warm and humid climate in southern China. But in the northwest of the country, it still hasn't made much progress. Nature abhors a vacuum, so the gap left by one creature will be filled by another. The Silk Road was one of the greatest trade routes in the world. It brought rare treasures to people on both sides of the Eurasian continent. With people from afar, new species quietly traveled with them. In the millennium that followed, one would thrive and eventually become the dominant crop of northern China. Every day at noon, Su Shaolin breaks some steamed bread into small pieces. Two hours later, he takes them to a restaurant and mixes them with mutton soup for a nutritious bowl of bread and mutton soup. For this old gentleman, Steamed bread is the best of foods. But it is not made from millet or rice. So where is this grain from? Tangkao Chinatown is a international hub. It's said to be the first hub in the world. Chang'an, today's Xi'an, was the first place in ancient China to receive the influences of West Asia. In the Qin and Han dynasties, Chang'an was the biggest city in the world. In the Tang dynasty, it was prosperous, with all kinds of people and cultures melding there. It was the most developed and open city in the world. The elderly gentleman, nearly 90 years old, believes his ancestors came here from the western regions in the Tang Dynasty. Tang Dynasty in the Tang Dynasty, the Guanzhong and Chang'an dishes. At that time, the main dishes were mainly the rice dish. The rice dish is the rice dish that we use today, the rice dish, the rice dish, the rice dish. It is believed that wheat, native to Mesopotamia, arrived in China several thousand years before the Tang Dynasty. For this crop, from a hot and dry climate, China's Yellow River Basin made a perfect home. In ancient times, people were always troubled by the shortage of food, so they were open to new food stuff and eager to adapt them. Our ancestors thought that our summer and the Xinjiang, Qinghai, the summer and the summer were the same. 
。结果秋季种下去，这一下子发生了一个革命性的变化，小麦由过去的玄麦，变成了现在的粟麦。也经过秋季、冬季、春季、夏季，这样一个农作物，长了四个季节。唐代人就已经认识，这是中和天地之气。But the high-yield wheat posed another problem. Chinese people steamed or boiled millet and rice before eating them. But steamed or boiled wheat tasted awful. When wheat was just coming into China, or we didn't know how to make it more effective, or we knew we didn't want to make it more effective, no matter what reason, the Chinese people for a long time don't like to eat the milk. For example, there is a very interesting word called "mai fan dou geng." The next word is called "jie ye ren shi." It means that you can eat the milk, 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 the milk. If a food tastes awful, it will be certainly rejected by anybody who is not starving. It seems that wheat had little to offer in competition with millet and rice. Very interesting is that wheat was introduced to this area, but did not immediately replace the local farmers' wheat. It was a long time, probably until the Tang Dynasty, which was until the Wei Qing period, that wheat was gradually replaced by the farmers' wheat. 在黄河流域地区开始普及开来，最终取代了小米，成为我们中国北方地区的主体的农作物，也就是说，北方地区人们的主要的食物。As time went by, agricultural society gradually changed. The propagation of a crop no longer depended on its natural qualities, but on the intervention of man. It's safe to say that without the influence of selection and cultivation by humans, today's natural world would look quite different. As wheat struggled to find a way into people's daily lives in China, the invention of the stone mill marked the beginning of a new era. Small mill made from flour, it was good. So it was developed into various kinds of flour. So in the Dongshan, the people of the Dongshan were forced to use flour, which is flour, to make flour into flour. The arrival of the stone mill was a milestone event in the history of food. It grinds wheat into flour, which can then be made into many kinds of food. When people from northern China moved to the south, they introduced it to southern China, where it was used to grind rice, leading to the great varieties of rice-based foodstuffs in the region. Constrained by their local geographical and climactic conditions, People in the north always energetically explored new agricultural technologies. To solve the problem of irrigation, the Qin Dynasty built the Zhangguo Canal, guaranteeing agricultural production in their state. The Large Water Conservancy project is impressive to this day.
The invention of agricultural tools and stone mills drove agricultural development to higher levels. Even today, in China's remote areas, traces of these ancient technologies can still be found. The ox-driven plow is one example. A group of senior citizens performing Huai In Lao Chong Opera reflects many details about life in ancient China. Some believe it was originally performed in sacrificial rites and was used to boost military morale. The site of Western Han Dynasty's capital granary is located not far away. 2,000 years ago, grain and cereals from all around the country were gathered here and then shipped to the capital at Chang'an, up the Wei Shui River. The Huai In Lao Chang Opera incorporates elements of boatmen's work songs. The boatman's work songs and the granary that fed an empire are long gone. Nowadays, the area is given over to large areas of farmland. Hua In Lao Chung Opera seems to express how busy the area had been in the Qin and Han dynasties. But this prosperity came to an end. In 311 AD, the Xiongnu seized Luoyang and captured Emperor Huai of Jin. The Western Jin court was forced to move to today's Nanjing. This was the first such move made by an imperial dynasty to the Yangtze River Basin. This little stream is interesting. A cup of liquor was floated down it. When it grounded in front of someone, that person had to drink the liquor and then compose a poem. This game arose in the Eastern Jin Dynasty more than 1,000 years ago. It is said that the famous calligrapher Wang Shi Zhu, who wrote the famous Preface to the Orchid Pavilion, once played the game here. After the Xiongnu overran Luoyang, the court and nobility of the Western Jin moved to the south. 
the economy in the middle and lower reaches of the Yangtze River then flourished. It is still very vigorous today. Later dynasties re-established themselves in the north and in the Sui and Tang dynasties the court's demand for rice increased. Different dynasties had always tried to increase the supply of rice in the north, but the areas of the north suitable for the growth of rice were very limited. After the court of the Western Jin Dynasty moved south, China's economic center also gradually moved south. A great project was born against this backdrop. This brick, 32 and a half centimeters in length and six and a half centimeters deep, is inscribed with characters from a thousand years ago. It was found in the old town of Luoyang and indicates that the town was full of cellars. The places marked with plants are cellar entrances. To date, over 400 such well-arranged cellars have been found. The Hanjia granary was a large one. It was 600 meters wide and 700 meters long. Granaries of this size were quite rare. In 749 AD, under the Tang Dynasty, the total grain production of the empire was nearly 750,000 tons. Of this, around 340,000 tons could be stored in the Hanjia granary. Why was so much grain stored here in Luoyang? Luoyang was one of the empire's most important cities, frequently serving as the imperial capital. Across 4,000 years, 105 emperors made it their capital. It controlled the fate of China in a long period of time. The brick was made in 697 AD and records information about a cellar in the Hanjia granary. The characters inscribed on the brick show that rice stored in that cellar was from Suzhou. In the Tang Dynasty, the Yellow River Basin was the key political center with a great weight of population, so a reliable supply of grain for the area was of critical importance. When Emperor Gao Zong of Tang was on his way to Luoyang in 682, some of his guards starved to death. This shows that food security was a serious issue for the empire. Luoyang was the central point between the grain-producing area of the south and the then capital city, Chang'an. It was the wealth center of the empire. Moreover, Empress Wu Zetian chose to live here and made it her capital after she took the throne for herself. The supply of grain became properly regulated as supplies from the south were transported to the new capital. 
rice became the exclusive prerogative of the privileged. A Grand Canal, starting in Hangzhou, transported rice from Suzhou, Huai'an, and other southern rice-producing areas up to Luoyang. It was the most important cargo carried by the canal. The remains of the huge granary at Luoyang bear witness to this importance. After the Tang Dynasty from the 10th century, China's economic center continued to move to the southeast. The logistic network of rivers and canals transporting grain to the capital served new destinations. The remains of its Luoyang section became confined to history. In the late 13th century, the Yuan Dynasty established their capital at Beijing. In addition to canal and river passage, they also started to transport grain by sea. Rice from the south was shipped to Tianjin by sea and then transported to the capital. In the subsequent Ming Dynasty, a granary was built northeast of Beijing to store the grain transported there by sea. Today, the site of the granary has been transformed into a park. Today, when rice is so widely enjoyed in North China and across the whole nation, Few know of the efforts and hardships over the past thousands of years that have made this possible. From the wild grasses of the south, to the banks of the Yangtze, to paddy cultivation across much of Asia and round the whole world, Rice has made a journey that has nurtured mankind in both body and spirit. <laughs>